I I'm sorry. Your entry 91325 is not valid. Please enter the valid digits followed by the pound sign or hash key. Thank you. The host has not yet arrived. If you are the host, please press the star key. You will hear music until the host joins and activates the conference.
For operator assistance at any time during your call, press star zero. The conference is now in silent mode. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome each of you to our webinar today on teaching students how to learn effective study skills. My name is Patty Wanamaker, and I'm going to be facilitating today's call. I'm an academic trainer with Milady, and um, I'm going to just make sure that everyone, first of all, is online. Um, you should see the actual screen on your computer with the opening slide. Um, you also should be dialed in to the 800 number. And I have put all of your calls on silence. So you um, can hear me, but I can't hear all of your background noise. Um, if you do have a technical challenge or you have a question, you may actually on the right hand of your um, computer screen, you will see where it lists all the participants. You can raise your hand or you can ask a question. And Sally Munter is going to be my support person today. She is on the call as well. She will be available to answer any of your questions if you're having any technical challenges. So again, I just want to make sure that everyone at this particular moment is um, viewing the screen and is able to hear me as well. And then we are going to go ahead and, um, and get started. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and do this. So again, today we're really focusing on uh, teaching our students how to really learn the most effective study skills while they're in our classroom. And <clears throat> learning how uh, to learn really should be the first lesson every individual is taught. Um, it's a lesson that really might be more important than what we learn in class itself. Um, it's essential that we teach our students the best possible learning skills. As we know, what they learn today eventually is going to become outdated or obsolete. But the skill of teaching them how to learn something and will assist them in continuing to master new information as they move forward and they progress through the years to come. A significant element in learning uh, process is really developing strategies for organization and using the information correctly. Um, our role as educators can play a significant part and helping our students achieve this by supporting effective study skills. Study skills can be incorporated really daily into our instructional process within our classrooms. Study skills can also be incorporated into different ways that we individually present the information and encourage our students to learn as well as study. Um, it may not really you know, be something that our students aren't familiar with, they have gone through school, they do have the, the background of, of being in that classroom environment, but often they may not really even think about how they can apply the information. So today we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple. We're really the information processing system, and we're also going to review specific learning tasks that really relate to specific elements such as reading, note taking, memorization, and organizing. So that's really where we're going to be going today. Um, so let's go ahead and jump to our next slide. So we're going to start talking a little bit about general learning strategies and what these strategies are as it relates to learning within our classroom. <clears throat> so general learning strategies are really strategies that students can apply to all elements of learning. They may be applied differently to different tasks, but essentially provide a foundation for developing all learning skills. 
So let's look at the first theory. And you know, any of us that are on the call are master educators. We are often doing some of these things within our classrooms. Um, number one, we must gain our students' attention. Uh, learning um, really occurs when our learner's attention is captured. There are really several techniques that we can use that effectively gain our students' attention. These could be telling a story, using an amazing antidote before we actually begin our lesson, using humor if it's appropriate, reading um, maybe startling statistics or facts, demonstrating maybe equipment or um, techniques, asking very provocative or thought-provoking questions, or even maybe engaging our students right in the beginning in some kind of learning activity. Effectively gaining our students' attention means arousing their interest, excuse me, um, and really giving them the step of where we're going to head in our lesson. It begins the learning process. Now, again, many of you are currently using the Lady Lesson Plans, and if you are, we have these already built into our lesson plans. Our gain attention is the relevancy and enrollment portion. The next is describing the goal. So, you know, it's important that we let our learners know what the purpose of the lesson is going to be. Remember, adult learners in our classrooms really value seeing the relationship between the information that we're going to review and their, their personal goals or their personal objectives. We must explain the relevancy of the information when we're presenting the course information. So consider asking students before we even start your lesson, ask the students to share how they think this information that you're going to review is going to address a specific goal for them personally. Remember today's students, you guys, it's what's in it for them. So our students today really want to know what's in it for them personally. So if we can begin our classes by describing the goal or the objectives of the class, we're going to get their attention from the beginning, and we're going to help them begin that learning process. The next theory of learning is building on past knowledge. Again, we just discussed this. We need to point out how new information that we're going to be covering relates or even expands on maybe information that we've personally provided them in the past in a classroom setting. Or, again, let's hold that discussion with the students and ask them how the information that you're covering relates to their past experiences. It could be past experiences in the workplace, past experiences just in their personal life. Remember, our students today come to our classrooms with past lives and past experiences. The next theory of learning is in the way that we present the material. When we're presenting new information, we need to help the learners see the relationship, again, between past experiences, their personal goals, and the class objectives. We also need to use a variety of presentation methods, such as visual learning, uh, diagrams, charts, written handouts, verbal explanations, demonstrations, activities. All of these are going to address specific learning types. Now, if any of you have ever been on any of our webinars or even have maybe attended a master ed class, you are probably very familiar with different learning styles. Well, the learning styles of our students really will relate to the way they personally process the information. So we need to really consider incorporating many different techniques into the way we present our lessons. If you can present many different forms of presenting a single topic, it's going to make those students become much more aware of the material, and they're going to want to spend that personal time listening. The next is providing guidelines for learning. Guiding students in the learning process is really a key part of what we do. We need to help them learn how to best learn the material, help students understand their personal learning styles, and how they personally learn the information. So what I mean by that is, for an example, consider coaching a student that is a visual learner 
and using visual methods such as charts or diagrams. Or for an individual that is very hands-on or likes to try things out, why not recommending hands-on activities so we really touch on that particular learner? You may need to help your students identify their learning styles. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the future, of how we can help our students identify their personal learning styles. Next step is provide an opportunity for performance. I think this is a very important aspect of learning, and it's something that we need to focus on within our classrooms. Learners must use the new information or practice the information immediately. So example, we're teaching them a new skill. They're going to learn that information in practical techniques, maybe in a lab setting or in the student salon. Also, assignments and projects are another typical method of practicing that educational setting and letting the students try on that new skill immediately. The next theory is providing positive and constructive feedback and performance. Feedback should be incorporated information that is available through us analyzing their performance and evaluating the steps that they're actually applying as they're learning the new skill. Often our students today as adult learners, they can often analyze their own performance but it's also crucial that we provide them that ongoing feedback. Remember, what we praise and what we recognize is going to get repeated. So it's very important that through this process, we evaluate our students and give them that continuing process. The next is how our students actually process the information. We talked earlier about each of our students have a specific learning style. Well, the learning style actually relates to the way we process our information. So again, we know as master educators that there are many ways in which our students learn. Students will move through their instructional steps more effectively if their individual styles are supported. So again, knowing how our students learn and providing them with different methods of helping them learn the information is going to be the most effective way to support them in their learning. Study skills also will be better facilitated if we can incorporate learning information in that process. So we're going to go ahead and take a little look at um, some different ways in which our students can actually process the information. Now this may be a little bit of a review for some of us that have been to some of our master ed classes or even some of us that have been on past webinars. But we're going to get through the information and I think it's really important that you reflect, if you're already aware of these concepts, reflect in your personal classrooms what you do with the information and how you support your students with the learning process. So we have the auditory Student. The auditory learner is, is really the individual that's going to learn best through traditional methods of teaching, such as lecture or discussion. Um, they use verbal input really effectively. Although reading usually isn't such a visual sense, <clears throat> it may be an effective approach for these students because it involves language. Maybe they're not visually seeing it or hearing it, but they are seeing the words which relate to what they are comfortable with. They follow verbal direction really well. Usually they're good at, <clears throat> at uh, memory of, of things, except, especially verbal information. Um, these students often may need to repeat things a couple times before they have that process of retaining the information. This type of learner really is going to enjoy discussions in your classroom. They're going to enjoy <clears throat> CDs, audio tapes, stories any kind of activities that really involve verbal communication. Next is our visual learner. Majority of our students in our classrooms are the visual learner. The visual learner really learns best by seeing examples, demonstrations, visual media such as videos, uh, film clips, 
PowerPoint presentations. Um, the information is most effective because it is presented in a visual form. The visual learners like to read. They like to visualize techniques. They learn traditionally best by diagrams, charts, maps, and computer, um, using computerization and allowing them that time on the computer. The next is our kinetics. These are individuals that like movement. They are learners that learn best by physical involvement. They learn best by doing. Um, these students are great with the hands-on portions, but even just the physical movement in the classroom. Um, so when we're working with these students, having them teach each other is a great way of them learning the information. Uh, participating in games, role playing. This student is going to learn most effectively through role playing, um, dramatization, skits. Um, the key here to this particular learner is they need to move around while they're studying. So in the classroom environment, if we are studying, making sure that we're getting these students up and getting them out of their chairs is going to, believe it or not, help them process the information that they're learning. Next is our tactical learner. These um, really like to manipulate different objects and learning methods. They like to touch. They like hands-on approach to learning. They do things best when they have a personal connection to the learning experience. Um, they really like rehearsing the information. They like projects, and they really learn best through activities, such as creating things, building, physically drawing, or even writing. These are the students, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be hands-on demonstrations, but they physically need to be in touch with the information. So again, I know that may be a little bit of a repeat to past webinars, but it's so very important that we allow our learners the process of information as it relates to them personally. So why don't we go ahead and take a look at now some specific tasks that we do within our classrooms every day. Um, and these are going to be tasks that we can assist our students in the learning process. So number one, we're going to look through reading. Every day our students are reading, note taking, memorization, organizing information, and studying. So let's go ahead and take a closer look. We're going to begin actually with reading skills. Now I think most of us on the call today are going to agree that the major barrier in today's learning in our student is the inability for them to read. As Mester educators, we are going to lay a solid groundwork of improved study skills which learners can build their career training experience off of. And I really believe one of the first areas that we need to emphasize is reading skills. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at a few things that we can share with our students in helping them improve their ability to learn and read, of course. So number one is we want to teach our students to get an overview of what they're going to be reading. So students should overview, or I like to say, like skim the material before they begin reading it in depth. What that means is we want our students to read chapter titles, headings, learning objectives, review questions, chapters, even uh, certain section summaries before reading the material further in depth. Even if the material is marked as summary or review, we need to share with our students that they should read these things first. It's going to help them become familiar with the information before they begin getting involved with the core context. And they're going to be able to retain that information more effectively. So number one, we want to have our students get an overview of the material. Next is we want to teach them how to use the overview of the material to get organized. So have the students use their overview as a guide. And what we would want to help them create is a category. So on a, maybe a piece of paper or even in their mind, 
making some categories of what they're going to learn. They can then begin sorting the facts and the information into categories rather than just a broad topic. Almost like mind mapping. I kind of think about this as mind mapping. You know, when we teach our students to mind map, we have them write a bubble with the concepts, and then we have them break out into arms with additional bubbles. That's almost what getting organized when reading is going to be about for them. So it's going to help them to get an overview and then get that overview organized. And the next is going to be asking questions. As students overview the material that they're going to be reading, have them write down any specific questions they have about the topic that they're going to be learning. And what we want to do is teach our students to look for the answers to the questions while they're in the process of reading. And tell the students that as they complete this type of, of introductory activity to reading, it's going to increase their familiarity with the material, which is going to lead them in greater comprehension. I think often we come up with our students that will read the material, but their comprehension of the material is what's lacking. So if we teach them to have a notepad next them or paper next to them. And again, get familiar with the overview, organize what topics are going to be discussed, and then write down specific questions. And as they discover those questions, as they read them, they physically write it down. This is one great way of teaching our students how they can increase their comprehension. And it's going to provide them with a great foundation for more in-depth, complex reading. So now that our students have the skills they need to read, let's go ahead and look at another step of reading, which is strategies for highlighting and underlining. Now, you know, all of us do this, and many of our students are, are doing this, but often they don't do it correctly. And we do need to teach our students strategies for highlighting and underlining. So one of the most common practices when we are reading and studying is to highlight and underline important phrases or concepts. That's the key here, phrases and concepts. Have you guys ever seen a textbook that really looks so that it's been completely colored in? There isn't one word that's not colored in. Well, I hate to tell you, but that's not the most effective way of highlighting. We really need to make our students understand the value of highlighting and underlining. And there are definitely techniques with this, this madness. And it is number one is focusing on keywords and phrases. We need to encourage our students to be selective in what they highlight. So they're only going to want to highlight the keywords, phrases, facts, or ideas. So really, if after they highlight, if they have more than 35%, 25 to 35% of that material is highlighted, they're highlighting too much. And then it, it defeats the purpose. They need to create a system also for when they're highlighting. As note taking, students really need to be able to be assisted in developing systems or organizing what they're highlighting and, and underlining. Students maybe need to use different colored highlight markers for different concepts. And remember, it, we know that when we use color as part of writing or highlighting, the way we memorize the information is through those colors. So we can teach our students that they can become organized with their highlighting by using different color highlight markers for different topics. And then in their mind, they can refer to that topic or that color and they relate together. Next is checking for clarity and meaning. Students should be advised to review their underlining and highlighting to ensure that it makes sense to them. I don't know about you, but I have done this. When I first started studying, I would highlight everything in my book, and then when I would go back as a review, I'd have to reread everything, and that defeats the purpose. So if we have over-highlighted, we again are defeating the purpose of highlighting. No, it's no. most effective when we highlight <laughs> terms. Next is going to be strategies for note-taking. 
This is something else that you know we assume our students should know how to note take, but we can't assume they know. They don't. So we need to spend some time teaching them effective note taking. So as we know, in our classrooms, you guys, you see a variety of note taking methods. You know, we have traditional note taking, which is the bullet point note taker. We have the student that likes to mind map or doodle while they're taking notes. You know, the method really isn't the most important here. What's the most important is how well organized the notes are and how understandable the notes are to that student when they're done. So let's go ahead and take a couple um, looks at some different techniques that we can share with our students. First of all, we want to teach our students to think about what they're hearing. Yeah, I know it sounds simple, but believe it or not, remind students to actively think about what they're writing down. For an example, consider how the information relates to other concepts that maybe they've learned in class. Um, you know, they shouldn't, we don't want them to think so much that they're then fall behind on note taking. But you know, the key here is, is that they need to really think about what they're writing down. Do they need to write down every word we say? Absolutely not. So we need to have them really think about what they're hearing. We can also have them, if they have questions, make sure they put a little post-it note or a symbol so they can refer to it later. The next is devise a shorthand method. Well, this is going to be easy for them. You know, today with today's technology, every student is doing some kind of shorthand abbreviation while they're texting. So this is something very easy to, to uh, teach our students. We need to suggest that they create some kind of shorthand symbols, abbreviations to really expedite the note-taking process. You guys relate it to texting. As soon as you relate it to texting, they're going to understand. So doing this is going to allow them to save more time from writing as well as it's going to help them retain the information more effectively. So, you know, have them in class devise their own little shorthand system for note taking, for, for key terms that you use on a continuum basis, right? So, you know, LOL, laugh out loud, same concept. Have them devise their own shorthand technique. I usually like to recommend that our students use a standard size note paper or even legal size note paper when they are note taking. It allows the student to organize their notes more effectively because there's ample space. You know, there's nothing worse than having a student write on a little piece of paper, cramming all the information in there. They can't read it. It's not legible. And then in the end, they're not able to actually refer to those notes. So I like, again, standard or even legal size. Often I like legal size if our students like to mind map because it gives them that ability to be a little bit more creative. Recognize and designate cues. Students can learn to recognize cues of information um, from you personally. So if you are writing everything on the board and those things you just show up on tests later, they will then know the cue that all these items are significant that are actually being written on the board. Also, sometimes you can change your voice. A change in your voice sometimes emphasizes a cue that this information is important. So we need to teach our students to recognize and, and be aware of consistent patterns or cues in the classroom. The next is clarity. Encourage your students to ask questions. If something is unclear to them, have them ask questions. Now, you may want them to park it in the parking lot and then ask it at the end of the class. Um, I know some classrooms I've seen real effective is um, a question board. And the students will write down the questions they have and they'll put it on a post-it note and then they'll go to the wall and place it on the wall. And then you as the educator, when you feel it's time and you want to answer those questions, you can pull off the notes off the wall and then provide that clarification. So it's important that we encourage our students to ask questions. More than likely, our students aren't asking questions because they're not comfortable raising their hand in a classroom setting. So sometimes if we can have them write down the questions on a note card, a scrap piece of paper, forward it up to us, we can then answer the questions in a comfortable setting for them. 
Next is our discussions after we've taken the notes. So if notes taking is, is not part of the discussion in your classroom. Ask your students to wait about it till the end of the day, and then maybe you as a team have a, a discussion on what notes were taken and have them review their notes. It's an opportunity for them to reflect back on what were the key points that you discussed. Next is record main points. Um, Suggest that our students begin writing down the main points of the lecture or the material that you're going to be presenting your classrooms. I'm assuming that everyone on the call begins your classroom with the objectives. You guys, I, I started my, my webinar today with the objectives. And my objectives, again, were identifying the general learning theories, understanding how we process the information, and then we are reviewing specific learning skills. So, I started out my webinar, and I always start out all my classes reviewing what the objectives or the main points are. So if you're not doing this in your classrooms, I would really encourage you to start your day out by reviewing what the objectives are for your day and have the students write those down. And it's a great way of them to start organizing and note-taking based off of your objectives. Because when the day is done, even though we know sometimes we get sidetracked in our classrooms, when the day is done, we have the objectives that we want to meet. When the day is done, I want these learning objectives that I just shared with you to be accomplished. So it's really important that if our students can write down these learning objectives and then fill in the information as they go along, that is when the learning process is going to take place. Next is fill in the blanks. So after we've recorded the main information, we want to encourage our students to fill in any blanks. And this sometimes could even be in when we're reviewing uh, at the end day. You know, you go through back through the main points. We always do in our classes, um, master ed classes, we always say, you know, did we accomplish what we wanted to today? And then we do a review. This is a great way of having your students fill in the blanks that they've missed along the way. So filling in the blanks. Having an organized system, again, separate note taking. I would encourage every student to have paper next to them, lined paper, blank paper, some kind of paper that they can get in the habit of note taking and having a system. And then sometimes we actually have to have separate reference pages, don't we? We have head charts, we have diagrams. So using those separate reference pages is also part of note taking. And we have to teach our students <coughs> excuse me, how to effectively use those reference pages. <coughs> Pardon me. Next we're going to talk about strategies for organizing, memorization, and learning. So for some subject matters, memorization of certain facts is necessary. It really is mainly the only way of learning that part of information. Memorization strategies also serve a unique purpose in organizing information for our students. We should point out to our students that memorization really is, the key to memorization is to being organized and having the information organized before we begin the process. So what I mean by that is an example. If a student decides to maybe use flashcards to help them organize important facts, um, we need to teach the students that they need to have those things uh, completed beforehand. So you know, getting the information onto the note cards would be one concept. So being organized before they begin the process of memorization. Um, also, it's important that we use different techniques um, because, you know, as our learners have different styles of learning, it's really effective if we can use a variety of techniques or a variety of methods being combined together, which really encourages them to be creative and invent their own methods, their own systems. You know, what works for me personally may not work for you, and vice versa. What works for you may not work for the person next to you. If we can teach our students a skill set of how to learn effectively and encourage them 
to create then their own system of using this material. That's when the learning is going to take place. So use repetition. Um, you know, unless they have a photographic memory, most of us or most of our students need to review the material several times before they know it. Remind students to schedule review time into their calendars. It reinforces the idea that scheduling and planning ahead is going to play a large part of the success of our students in learning. They have to create that time. And creating time is about having repetition. Using multiple sensory systems. We just talked about this. Again, basically this is identifying their preferred learning style. And then once they've identified their preferred learning style, having them try different techniques. So example, a visual learner might really learn best from diagramming a concept that they've just learned. But they also could listen to a tape or a lecture or write a summary down. These are all part of visualization as well, just based off of a different form. So again, using those multiple sensory method is going to help them with memorizing the information. Practice and drill. You know, drilling and practicing is all part of repetition, isn't it? It's flashcards, it's quizzing, it's practicing testing. Um, these are all examples of practice and drilling the information. And then the next is drawing and visualization, a great way of helping our students get um, organized and, and working in that memorization is using diagrams, charts, graphs, cartoons, pictures, all reinforce the material. So think about alone in our classrooms. If we're using PowerPoints and we're creating PowerPoints, are we using pictures in our, in our PowerPoints? Are we using silly cartoons? Are we using clips from YouTube? These are all things that are visual that are going to reinforce the learning process. Teach the students to practice visualizing the information. You know, for some students, visualizing is the entire process that's going to help them recall the information. And the majority of our learners in our classrooms are very visual students. So mind mapping is a part of visualization and drawing. That's a great way of them memorizing the information. Um, diagramming a haircut on a head chart is a great way of visualizing and drawing and memorizing that technique or information. The next is associating concepts. We should help our students pull new information. So what that means is point out how the new concepts of information really, again, ties into what they've already learned, what they've come to the classroom with, what they're already familiar with. So this is a great way of associating concepts. Sometimes we call these concept connectors. And this is, again, another way of helping them memorize. Next is something called mnemonic devices. These are techniques used that help the students recall information. You know, the one that I always think of is the I before E except after C. And you know, you guys, I'm 45 years old, and still to this day, when I'm writing certain words out or typing certain words out, I say I before E except after C. Now, I learned that probably in grade school. And over the centuries, I'm still using it. So mnemonic devices is a great way of helping the students associate things to get them to recall on the information. Next, say it out loud. <clears throat> Reciting information out loud is a great way of mastering information. I know you as educators do this because I personally do this, even before my webinar today. I recited and went through and role played and said my lesson plan out loud. I do this every morning before I teach. Usually it's in the shower, but I do it. So we need to keep our, you know, help our students understand that they need to sometimes say it out loud. And this is a great activity that we can do in our classrooms. Get everybody in a circle and everyone standing and 
everyone takes you know one or two phrases of something that that we're going to learn and and they take ownership of it and they say those few phrases and then it goes to the next student and it becomes a fun activity but it helps them with memorizing the material next is write it down write down some summaries you know based off of what they've recited out loud, then have them write it down. So they're saying it, they're doing it, and then they're writing it down. It's a great way of memorizing the information. And the last is pretty simple. You know, it's just do it. We have to get our students in the habit of trying on these new skills and doing it. That's how they are personally going to master. The next is we're going to take a look at a creative, um, creating a really study-friendly environment. And um, these are things that we can apply into our classroom, and these are also things that our students can take with them. So number one, you know, our students need to feel a very um, friendly environment. And you know, it really depends on their learning style. It depends on their tolerance for different distractions and, and stimulation within the classrooms. So these are all very personal. But number one is you know, using an effective physical environment. Um, teaching our students that they are in control of their learning environment. And you know, the seating should be comfortable. The lighting should provide bright illumination. It shouldn't be glaring. It shouldn't be dark. Um, they should have a desk space that they can make as their own that isn't cluttered, it's not crowded. Um, they also should consider um, uh, ergonomics. It's a way of, you know, them sitting comfortably with their feet flat on the floor, elbows and knees flexed, usually bent. I think it's about a 90 degree angle, I would say. Um, you know, elbows should be close to the body. These are things that help the body feel comfortable in the learning process. Um, take breaks is another thing. Our, we need to teach our students that they should be taking short breaks while they're studying. Getting up and moving around actually helps stimulate the blood flow. It prevents fatigue. And often our students are not doing this enough. We aren't doing this enough in our classroom. So we need to start getting our students up and taking a few minute breaks, three minute breaks, get them up out of their chair. Uh, remove distractions. All right. You guys, you know today our students are multiple taskers, right? They multitask. These are the students that have the iPods on, they're texting, they've got their workbook open, they're IMing and they're Facebooking all at one time. And I personally think, oh my God, how can they learn that way? Because I personally can't, but they can. So, you know, we have to teach them that we can remove certain distractions, um, but you know, to some students, they can listen to music. Some students can you know, have their, their computer on and it's not a distraction. So we need to be flexible with removing distractions. This really is about a personal preference and having them identify their personal um, distractions and what they can learn under. This is, um, I think one of the most important is the biorhythmics. You know, having the students identify, are they a morning or are they an evening person? You know, each individual is different when they're the most alert, when they're the most creative, and when they can concentrate. And it's important that we teach our students to have them evaluate when is the most effective time for them to study. I am a morning person. I do my best studying personally in the morning. And you know what? After 5 o'clock, I am no good. I do not want to sit at the computer and study. I don't want to sit at my desk and study because I'll read it about 200 times and have to read it again. So I know I'm a morning person. So we need to teach our students to identify what is the best time for them to study. We also need to teach our students to create a schedule um, you know, based on assignments, the, the, their prime time for studying, um, what other demands are put on them, but having them create a schedule and putting in, penciling in when they're going to actually designate a studying time. The next is being organized and prepared. You know, there's nothing worse than going to sit down and study and you don't have all the material that you need. So we're going to teach our students that everything they need should be at hand, pen, paper, Post-its, highlighters, 
whatever. Everything should be organized. I actually personally have a little um, like carry tote. It's the little plastic caddy that I have all my stuff in, and that's what I use when I'm going to study. And I've got it all right there. It doesn't matter what desk I'm sitting at, but I have it. And then use task-specific techniques. And we're going to look at those in just a few minutes. But again, you know, it was about reading and note-taking. Those are things that we really can teach our students to be conscious of and to utilize while they're studying. When it relates to studying habits, many of our students suffer from something called learning book anxiety. <clears throat> This is, um, it causes them to relate to something unpleasant that's taken place with them in a previous classroom environment. It could be related to homework. It could be related just to the classroom environment itself. The key for us to help our students break through this anxiety problem is to teach our students how to relax and how to prepare to study. So let's go ahead and take a look at some different study techniques that I think will help them. I often actually think it's a great idea to create a little checklist for our students and have them use this to help them be prepared to study. So number one, take charge. You know what? We have to teach our students that they must be personally responsible for their own learning. You know, it goes back to being accountable. We are there to guide their learning experience. The institution is there to provide them with the education. But ultimately, it is the student's responsibility to take charge. So we need to have them take charge of their personal learning experience. We also, we also want to have them define personal values. Students really need to establish their own personal valuable, value, excuse me, not valuable, and principles as it relates to them personally. Set prioritizing and, and prioritize goals. You know, have students decide what's important to them personally in their career. Have students prioritize their goals. And you know what? Do this in the beginning of class with them. And make them take ownership of it and use this as a tool to reflect back on why they need to be accountable. Next is just show up. Share with your students the value of missing class. What happens when they miss class? You know, it is, it's a famous statement that 90% of life is just showing up. Think about that. 90% of life is just about showing up. So if you're not showing up to class, you're not meeting your, your personal obligations to your education. So we need to share with them the value of showing up to class. Get correct assignments. Again, our students need to take ownership and accountability of getting the correct assignments that they need. And then again, establishing a schedule. You know, I would teach your students to use a, it could be a calendar, it could be a hard calendar, it could be a calendar that they use um, online, but having them create a weekly schedule, outlining personal obligations, work, and then again, a time for them to schedule in their study time. They need to pick a place. You know, it's important that our students have a place of their own that they can set aside and they can go and study to. Again, it should be comfortable, it should be a good chair, it should be a desk, it's not laying on the bed or on the couch, it's actually having a designated place to study. Stand up and look away. Again, it gives the students time to let them physically get up, let their mind wander for a few minutes, and then get back to it. In our classroom settings, these are little energizers. When our students need a break, get them up for three minutes. Get them moving around, do a silly dance, a stretch, something. It helps them get away. It will help them actually get more engaged when they sit back down. Divide work into mini assignments. You know, there's nothing worse than having a huge project on your plate and you get fearful. Teach our students that they can break up their assignments into mini assignments. And when they accomplish a little mini assignment, they get to put a check mark or a star or a happy face next to it. It's an easy way of taking a huge assignment and accomplishing it in a friendly environment. Tackle the difficult first. Whenever possible, we need to empower our students to start with the most difficult or boring part of their study first. 
save the fun for dessert. Right? At some point we've all done this. I know I do this often. I will start with the easy fun stuff and then I will lose sight and then I have the heavy stuff I have to accomplish. And what happens? I become frustrated. I might miss a deadline and it's not effective. So you know what? The key here is tackle the difficult first and then do the easy stuff for last. It's the dessert. And then last is, you know what? We have to teach our students to reward themselves. When they are done with their studying, it's important that they reward themselves for their accomplishments. We do this in our classrooms. What gets praised and recognized gets repeated. So if our students can praise and reward themselves for good study habits, it will get repeated. So let's take a quick look at how we can take this to the classroom. We're coming down here to the end. We've covered a lot of material, but I'd like for you to think about how you can take some of this information into the actual classroom setting. So learning style preferences. Again, we know that our students have specific ways and styles that they like to learn best, the most effective. So we need to teach our students to identify their learning styles. How do we do that? There's a couple different ways. Number one, there is a questionnaire in our Master Ed book that talks about multiple intelligence and they do a little self questionnaire. Some of you have already heard me talk about this. I think I mentioned it on the last webinar. But if you don't have that, um, your students can go online. There are a million different learning style uh, preference questionnaires, if you will, or assessments that are online. So your students can go online, and it could be a homework assignment. Let them do it online. Let them discover their learning preference. Because if they know their learning preference, they then can take ownership of how they have to receive the information. Remember, we learn the information, we process the information. It's related. So that's a great beginning thing we can do in our classrooms. Internet research, you know, this might be a fun little um, side project, but once they've identified their learning, they can go in and then type in their learning type, and it will list all the ways that they can use to study most effective. So again, if they're a visual learner, they can type their visual learner in, the most effective study techniques, and it will list out a list of things that they personally can take ownership and do in their own life to most be effective in learning. The next is the syllabus or a calendar combo. Again, you know, we need to provide our students with a schedule of what we're going to be covering and when we're going to be covering it. And we need to encourage our students to practice this thought process in their calendar. So they need to, again, we can give them a hard copy calendar. Today, phones have calendars on them. Computers have calendars on them. You know, Technology is beautiful because we can really get organized. But if we teach our students to use the calendar not only for their personal lives but for their study process, it could cue them. It could give them a reminder. My calendar gives me a day reminder, a, an hour reminder, down to the minute. So we can use these calendars to really help our students become organized and incorporate time for studying. And then, again, um, you know, assignments for time frames. Uh, ideally, if you can give your students a guideline of how much time you think it would take them to, to review this material, study this material would be very helpful. Um, again, they may have to make consideration depending on how great of a, a student they are at studying. But, you know, giving them some kind of guidelines for time frames is a really key thing. And the last I have down is goal sheets. Help our students create goal sheets that, you know, again, document long-term goals, short-term goals, timelines. Um, and, and important, have them leave um, some space that they can write notes and reminders of when they need to accomplish projects and tasks. These are skills that are, you know, they're going to take with them for the rest of their lives. The key here is, you know, we have to assist our students in learning how to study effectively. They don't just come to us with these skills. And we do have to take the time 
and work with our students individually sometimes in how they can study the most effective. What I'd like to do is I have a personal call to action for you. What I'd like for you guys to do with this information that we've just reviewed is I'd like for you to create a little checklist for your students with some helpful hints of ways that they can most effectively study. They can use this little reference tool as um, a personal reference sheet. But they also can give it to maybe friends or family members, people that are in their lives, that can also help them create the ideal study environment. So what I'm looking at is I think that if we could create this little checklist for our students, and again, it could be down to you know what their study space should look like, having notepads, having highlight markers. I mean, we can really create anything we want. Um, but Sharing this with our students will empower them to take ownership of their own learning techniques. So that's my, my call to action to you is, is I'm going to challenge you to create a checklist and then share it with your students. Give this to them. Maybe it's the first couple days of class when you're talking about effective study skills. I'd like to leave you guys with this quote. I found this the other day and I thought it was really empowering. Get over the idea that only children should spend their time in study. Be a student so long as you still have something to learn. And this will mean all of your life. As educators, we are lifelong students. We have the privilege of sharing information with our students. You know, I personally can't think of a better gift to give our students than the gift of teaching them how to learn effectively. I started out today talking about how you know, the material we're teaching them today will become obsolete at some point or outdated. But we can teach them a gift that's going to stay with them the rest of their life, and that is how to effectively learn. So I would personally like to thank each of you for your energy today, your commitment to education, commitment to our industry. I want to thank you for participating on our call. If you would like to get more information on um, effective uh, uh, teaching and learning methods, you can go online to our faculty development classes. There are 18 different modules to choose from. There is an entire module on adult learning, and it basically is the www.miladies.sendage.com. And you can go right in there and uh, pull up any information that you would like to get uh, as it relates to faculty development. And I would like to personally um, invite you to our next webinar. It's going to be talking about brain dominance and learning styles. So taking what we learned today to the next level, if you will, it's going to be on March 16th um, at 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You can go on to the www.milady.cengage to review our calendar of, of upcoming events and webinars. You can register online. Um, check us out on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, you guys, I want to thank you again so much for your time. I look forward to our, our next webinar together. Make it a great day, and um, have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.